The next question is, parents rate our local schools very high. Graduation rates are high, but statewide, Minnesota has one of the worst achievement gaps in the U.S. What reforms do you promote to overhaul our educational system and reduce the achievement gap? Well, I think it's, uh, it's important, like you said, to recognize that we do have good schools in our area. And for those who are wondering, the achievement gap is measured at the education results that are attained by uh, white students versus those who are of a minority background. And embarrassingly, Minnesota does have one of the, the worst achievement gaps uh, in the nation. There's a couple of things we can do. The first thing we can do is we can pass the proposal that was offered last session for alternative teacher licensure. And what this does is it provides an alternative pathway for qualified teachers to get into the ch classroom that are focused on results. This is a proposal uh, that is actually supported by President Obama. It's supported by Secretary Arne Duncan, his uh, Secretary of Education. And in addition, uh, is actually supported by four of the Democrat uh, education chairs at the state legislature. So this is a common sense approach. Unfortunately, even though we had the votes to pass it last session, the, uh, the teachers union was successful in blocking that effort. That's the first thing we could do, is get alternative teacher licensure into the classroom. The second thing we can do is we can have tenure reform. Right now, if you were to talk to parents in our school district and ask them, how would you like your teacher, the teacher of your children determined? Would you prefer to have a teacher who is shown to have proven academic res results and improving academic achievement? Or would you want somebody who, is, who keeps their job because of seniority? Uh, it's a no-brainer. People would choose quality. There absolutely has to be a link between student, te uh, student effectiveness, teacher effectiveness, tying those two together. And those are, those are two uh, structural reforms that need to pl take place. Third and finally, and that's the overall issue of the union pension fund. Uh, in the last, uh, the last session, uh, the legislature passed an 80, a bill that takes $80 million a year, when it's fully phased in, $80 million a year out of the classroom and puts it into the union pension fund to bail it out. Now, there's a way to help fix this, and that is for new teachers who are hired, just the new teachers, have them transition to a 401k plan like the, everybody else in the real world is doing. For those teachers who have already been hired and have made a promise to belong to the pension fund, uh, we can keep those promises. But in the long run, we can save billions of dollars by having new teachers transition into a uh, 401k model, a defined contribution plan versus a de defined benefit plan. That's going to free up additional resources. So those are, the, those are just three of the ideas I would support, but there are, there are many more. Multitude, I'm sure. Also along education lines, post-secondary institutions report that generally 40% of incoming students need remedial help in math. What legislative changes need to occur to reform our state's educational system? And I think this is more along the math piece than the other portions that you were discussing. Sure. Well, it's, um, it's unfortunate the, the last legislature actually did away with some of the grad-based standards, uh, graduation tests, the grad tests for doing that. But I think what we need to demand is uh, more accountability and more rigor in our K-12 system. So, for example, uh, I authored a bill to actually incentivize kids. It was called the, the Early Graduation Achievement Act. And what this bill would do is it would give students the choice that if you work hard and you graduate early from high school, we're going to give you a scholarship that you can use for college or post-secondary institutions of your choice. And this is a triple win. Uh, number one, it motivates kids to try harder. Number two, because of the, the quirks in the school funding formula, it would actually save the state of Minnesota money. And third and finally, it's going to make parents really happy because it's going to help make college more affordable for these kids. So this is sort of a, a post-secondary enrollment options is a program we have available right now. This is sort of a, a turbocharged version of that to reach those kids, to have them go to Dakota County Technical College, uh, to go to the university of their choice in Minnesota, so that they're able to, to realize that a high school diploma isn't as much a certificate of attendance as it is a benchmark for a certain level of learning. And once students have met that benchmark, Let's, let's not hold them back. Let's move them forward and let's get the job done. So that's an example of the type of reform that I've offered uh, in St. Paul and hopefully we'll be successful in implementing next session. Thank you. In 2006, the Chamber supported passage of the Clean Water Legacy Act, 
which creates a policy framework for implementation of the federally mandated impaired waters program. The law requires coordination and cooperation among state agencies and local units of government, sets goals and priorities for assessing, evaluating and restoring re impaired waters, and establishes a mechanism for ongoing oversight of program implementation. How would you work with to ensure that Dakota County region protects the Mississippi River and our local assets? Well, I would, um, uh, while the Mississippi River is important, I think it's important to remember that we've got um, the Vermilion River cutting through our district. Mm -hmm. uh, it's one of the only trophy designated trout streams in a metropolitan area across the uh, entire United States of America. So it is a, it is a crucial issue uh, for our district. And I think what we do is a good job in Dakota County of doing is balancing uh, local control uh, with state requirements. So again, what the state does is they set a standard. They say, here's the goals we're looking for in working with our federal government in terms of water quality and making sure that we retain private property accesses, but here's the goal. Now, local units of government, you come up with a way to meet that goal. You come up with a way to meet that standard. And by partnering with local townships, by partnering with the, the soil and water and conservation boards, that's the way you do it, by preserving that local control over those matters and having those policy matters decided at the local level. Thank you. Minnesota's business and residential customers' electricity needs are steadily growing, and energy infrastructure is linked to economic development. The need for additional baseload electricity generated by plants that run 24 hours a day, seven days a week, will occur within the next 15 to 10 to 15 years. How would you address this growing concern? Well, it's, in, uh, it's important to recognize that while we certainly want to promote renewable energy and we want to see uh, wind and solar developed, there is a cost component to these clean energies. And that's why it's so important that we have baseline power. And it is, uh, it is, it's very frustrating at the Capitol because on one hand we've got people arguing they want no coal-fired power plants. They want, we don't want to have any new energy agreements for coal-fired plants. And then they argue we can't have hydro plants because uh, hydro is going to kill fish and it's up in Canada and it's a bad idea. And then they argue we don't want to use natural gas because they don't want to mine for it. And then they say we have to have a moratorium on nuclear power plants. Well, you take away gas, you take away coal, you take away nuclear, and you take away hydro, uh, what's left? And the key is, is that if we're going to have a reliable energy infrastructure, we have to have diversification. Just like when we are investing for our retirement, the key is diversification. So my, my opinion is, is that especially as we move cars away from fossil fuels and plug them into the electric grid, what we're going to need to have is additional power. So the first thing is, let's repeal the ban on nuclear power plants in Minnesota. Right now, in current statute, we're not allowed to even consider studying nuclear power plants. Building a nuclear power plant in Minnesota is going to help keep rates low, provide us with the supply that we need. But more importantly, it's going to create hundreds and thousands of permanent high-paying jobs. Uh, this is something that's supported on a bipartisan basis. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. uh, we have not been successful in getting it passed to the legislature. I'm hoping next year we can do that. But then uh, the second thing we can do is make sure that we're, not, that we're able to uh, enter into agreements to buy power from other states where they have uh, coal, where they have natural gas. Those are the mechanisms we need to implement to make sure that we have a reliable energy supply. Again, uh, energy supply, the way it's reliable, it's reliable is not through scarcity, but through abundance. How important is a statewide economic development policy? Do we need to attract new businesses? Who should be in charge of business attraction and retention? Well, absolutely, it's important that we have a statewide plan, but I do think that there are regional differences to account for some of these. For example, the, the Job Z program in rural Minnesota to uh, help uh, rural businesses be developed to maintain jobs there, to maintain property values and the property tax base in those areas. But I think that the best way that we can create jobs is through the Department of Employment and Economic Development, uh, through DEED, by having an aggressive strategy, not only to retain the businesses that are here, so we don't lose these businesses um, that every day South Dakota is advertising on the radio saying, bring your business to South Dakota, having an aggressive strategy to retain those businesses, 
but also to find that those startup ventures and to do things with the angel investor tax credit to make sure that we are encouraging businesses. We tell, Minas tell those businesses that Minnesota is open for business and we have an educated, productive workforce and we'd welcome you here, not tax the snot out of you as some other people are proposing. Is there any questions from the audience? Gary's got a question. <laughs> I'll ask this question while we're waiting. Hmm. Uh, what is your position on the new Viking Stadium, and how should it be financed? Well, it's uh, you know the Vikings are an important asset. We want to keep the Vikings in Minnesota. I think the best way to do that is through a, a plan where the public sector is involved, where those who are using the facility uh, pay for the facility. So, for example, if there is a ticket tax on those who are attending it. Uh, a parking surcharge for those who are parking at it, a contribution from the from the local Viking from the Vikings organization. It's important. We want to make sure that we keep the Vikings in Minnesota. We want to learn from the mistakes of of Cleveland, of St. Louis, of Baltimore, all these places. Uh, the NFL team, the pro football team left, and in every case, they ended up spending two or three times as much money to get a team to re relocate back here. So again, if we can have those who are using the facility pay for the costs of it, I'm open to that. And also something I'm willing to consider is, um, is the Racino out at Canterbury Park. Uh, we have all the problems of legalized gambling. Right now, we get none of the benefits. Uh, if we were to allow slot machines at Canterbury Park where they already have parimutuel uh, gambling, I wouldn't be opposed to having some of those funds be used to keep the Vikings in Minnesota. Thank you, and this is from the audience. What is your salary per year? Have you implemented a pay freeze? Do you have a retirement and insurance plan? And I'm assuming that's from the state. That's a, a fair question. Uh, well, I'm assuming the uh, questioner means my, my public sector job and not my private sector income. Right. I'm assuming that's what the, uh, the question means. A legislator's salary is just over $31,000 a year. On top of that, there's something called per diem during the legislative session that works out to $77 a day. So total compensation, uh, all per diem, all compensation for me works out to a little bit over $40,000 a year. Uh, the retirement plan is that uh, the state of Minnesota will match 150% of your contribution of the first 4% of your income that you put into it. So in my case, I put in about $1,440. Uh, you don't get 401k on the per diem, but the, uh, the $1,400, and then they match that with a contribution of approximately $2,000 that goes into it. Uh, I think it's important at this, you know, to point out that uh, I'm sort of a, uh, a rarity at the Capitol. I actually have a private sector job away from the legislature. Uh, increasingly, we're seeing the legislature turn into a group of full-time politicians or people who are community activists, whatever the heck that means, and people who are, their entire life is government. Uh, and I'm proud of the fact that I have a, a private sector job. One of, the, one of the biggest problems we have in government right now is that people are turning politics into a career. And if there was one thing we could pass at the state to, uh, to reform government and to help get good results, it would be to pass term limits and to make sure that people go in, they serve on a part-time basis, they maintain their private sector jobs like I do, they get in, they serve the public, and then they move on and get out of there. Uh, there are people at the legislature who have been there since I was one year old. They were elected in 1972 and they haven't left. And when somebody's career is politics, they're not thinking about the public good. They're not thinking about the next generation. They're thinking about the next election. And they're thinking about how they're gonna maintain their, their checkbook and their paycheck at the legislature. So really, the most important thing we could do, more important than any uh, policy reform is to pass term limits and make sure that we get rid of the career politicians of both parties, get rid of the people who are living off the government, and uh, have people make sure that they have that concept of a citizen legislature. Thank you. You've uh, outlined very many important proposals tonight, and you can finish with your closing statement. Uh, well, again, I'd like to thank the Dakota County Regional Chamber of Commerce for uh, hosting this forum tonight, and again, for the constituents here. I always tell people that I wish I could promise everybody that I am gonna agree with you on every single issue, uh, but I can't, the world's more complicated than that. What I can promise you is that I'll always listen, I'll always respect your viewpoint, and I'll always remember that I work for you, not the other way around. It's been an honor to serve as your state representative, and I look forward to the opportunity for another two years. Thank you.